the way that this is a willing community to have wind turbines, and I want to share my time now with the member from Halton. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to, want to let you know I have great faith in the people of Ontario. I think that Ontario is a great province, and Ontario will rise to lead again. It's the government over there that I don't have too much faith in. Ontario, Ontario is a great province, and it will be number one again. This government over here, not so much. You know, our new Premier was sworn in on February 19th, and in her first initiative, she swore in a very large cabinet. She knew that would be controversial. Why would she do that? Well, during her, um, her uh, run for the, for the leadership, uh, which she won on January 26th, and congratulations to her, uh, there were many people in her caucus who helped her. And, of course, that creates a debt. A, uh, she, she needs to pay those people back. And she did so. She paid five or six of them back by creating a very large cabinet. And, that cabinet cost Ontario taxpayers a lot of extra money. Why should we be concerned about a larger cabinet? Because it costs taxpayers a lot of extra money. Each cabinet minister probably has six or seven staff. They have a travel budget. They have, uh, they have um, uh, chauffeurs. They have uh, uh, offices that they have to pay for. It probably costs close to a million dollars each. So that larger cabinet probably cost the taxpayers of this province five or six million dollars. So here are the Premier's first act that she did. The first thing she did on becoming Premier was to pay back promises, pay back her debts, her leadership debts, to people in her caucus, and she did so at the expense of the Ontario taxpayer. Spending Ontario taxpayers' money to pay her own debts. I'm sorry she did that because it created an impression. In effect, this Premier paid five or six million dollars back to the, people, to, to, the, to the people that she owed for her leadership. And that's, um, that's too bad. That was taxpayers' money. And this was done as the first item of business in her mandate. I wish her first action hadn't used taxpayers' money in this way. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. The cancellation, cancellation of the gas-fired power plants, that's um, being in Mississauga and Oakville, were funded also by uh, taxpayers' dollars. They canceled uh, the Mississauga plant during the election, and they did that in order to save five seats in Mississauga and Oakville and Otopico. So taxpayers funded a seat saver program for the Liberal Party of Ontario. Who cancelled the plans? Well, the Minister of Energy, Chris Bentley at the time, said he did not do it. He said in a committee hearing last, uh, last summer that the Liberal campaign team cancelled those plans. At that time, the Premier was co-chair, the Premier, Kathleen Wynne, was co-chair of the Liberal campaign team. So she was in charge or help more purportedly in charge as co-chair of running the campaign for the Liberals' re-election. She claims she has no knowledge of the cancellation. And that gives me great concern that the Premier has taken that position. She was co-chair, and she's asking us to believe that the most important decision that the campaign team made during the election, and she's suggesting that she had no knowledge, no input into that decision. At the very least, as a senior cabinet minister, as co-chair of the Liberal campaign team, she failed in her fiduciary responsibilities to the taxpayers of Ontario. I'd like to believe the Premier, but the facts make it very difficult to do so. Then on February 14th, Valentine's Day, and there was a lot of love in the air, the Premier wrote a letter to the leader of the PC party and to the leader of the NDP party, promising that a select committee would be struck to, get, to find out the conditions under which the gas plants were cancelled and who was responsible. There were no conditions in that letter. It was a promise, a written promise. 
It seemed that she had a genuine desire to get the facts out. It seemed like a new beginning. However, then, three days later, our House Leader, Government House Leader, whom we just heard from, backtracked and added conditions, strings, to the promise, suggesting that the contempt charges had to be withdrawn before a select committee could be struck. Why was this condition all of a sudden put in? What happened after the February 14th promise? One might think that new information was given to the Premier. New information that made it necessary to backtrack on a written promise. She knew there would be a backlash, but she backtracked on it anyways. Then last Thursday, on February 21st, more documents came from the OPA, the Ontario Power Authority, regarding the cancellation of the power plants. Papers that incidentally had been held since last November and were not forthcoming until the contempt charges were reintroduced on February 20th. So you're going to ask the question, how much does the Premier know about that question? In fact, how much have they told the Premier about this situation? And who is it that is, telling, that is withholding this information from the Premier if, in fact, we believe what she says? And for one, I would like to believe her. She is my Premier of this province, and I would like to believe what she says. It means a lot to the integrity of our entire system. You know, if we look at the, at the sequence of events that have happened here, the first, the taxpayers' dollars were spent in order to enlarge the cabinet so the, so the Premier could pay off her political debts. Second, she denied involvement, she denied any knowledge of the power plants, even though she was co-chair and a senior cabinet minister at the time. Third, she reneged on the written promise to strike a, to strike a standing committee, select committee, under very confusing situations. Introduction of contempt charges, introduction of, in, in, introduction of more papers, from uh, more, more documents from the, uh, from the Ontario Power Authority. Well, it hasn't been an auspicious start for this Premier. If I were to give the Premier some advice, given the situation that Ontario is in today, I would suggest that she should clear the slate. I should suggest she should get the information out through any and all means possible. I, suge I would suggest that the Select Committee should be struck where sworn witnesses can get to the bottom of this sort of affair. Do it this spring. Get it behind us. Get this thing, this whole situation behind us so that we can move forward with the things that Ontario needs desperately at this time. We can move forward with jobs. We can move forward with the reduction of red tape. We can move forward with all of the things that Ontario and the people of Ontario desperately need. Let's move a motion right now, because there's none, none of them here. We, can, we, can, uh, we, have, we currently have a debt of about $250 billion. That needs to, dramatic attention from this government and from this House, and it needs attention as soon as possible. We have a huge deficit. The government suggests it's going to be $12 billion. I suspect it'll be a little larger than that. But it's certainly one of the largest we've had in history. This government has been saddled with, with debts and deficits since its, since its beginning. We're currently spending, as the previous speaker said, $11 billion in interest. Imagine what you could do with $11 billion a year if we could only start reducing our debt. We could build 11 huge hospitals per year. We have to get on with the business of Ontario. We have to get on to the creation of jobs. 
We have to get on with being held up from that over this mess that's here. Finish with the mess. Have a select committee. Get it behind us. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? The member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm going to take this opportunity following the, the speech from Mr. Chudley to go back to a point that I think all parties in this House should agree on and one that I think believes that I believe needs to be recognized in the budget coming forward, and that is the recommendation coming from our party, from our leader, Andrea Horvath, that there be a five-day home care guarantee. Speaker, I am quite sure that there is a shared experience of every person in this chamber of dealing with constituents who find themselves in a desperate situation, either personally or for an older member of their family, or a member of their family who's facing serious illness, where they have to wait for home care and find themselves in an impossible situation. According to Ontario's Auditor General, in some communities, Ontarians are waiting as long as six months to receive home care services. Speaker, you're very well aware that when people need nursing care, when they need nursing care at home, six months is not an acceptable wait time. Five days is still going to be something of a burden on some households, but frankly, five days as opposed to six months is something we could justify to the people of Ontario, something the people of Ontario would want. You can't delay medical care, you can't delay home care for extended periods of time without having serious impact on people's lives. Speaker, there's an opportunity for this government to garner support from our party, to garner support from the majority of people living in this province by moving forward on this pledge. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, I'm pleased to rise to speak and comment on the um, remarks made by my colleague opposite from Halliburton, Kawatha Lakes, and Brox. I want to remind the House, Mr. Speaker, that the government's commitment through this own speech focused on fiscal responsibility, economic growth, and increase in employment. And I also want to remind the House, Mr. Speaker, that we have increased in employment of by the tune of 380,200 net new jobs from right since June 2009. Furthermore, Ontario has recovered 143% of jobs lost since the recession, Mr. Speaker. So I want to remind the members, my colleague opposite. The other piece, Mr. Speaker, the throne speech clearly talks about job creation and that our government, listening to the opposition members, that we will be creating the job strategy, which is being considered and supported by both opposition. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, our government is supportive of the business community, and I don't know where my colleague opposite talks about killing businesses and what have you, yet in the throne speech we talked about, Mr. Speaker, right increasing there, in right. exemption threshold for employer health tax. Again, that's supporting of employer. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to reviewing corporate tax compliance. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to 50 to $300 million of federal provincial venture capital fund to support, again, businesses. Again, Mr. Speaker, we also committed to increasing access to capital for small and medium-sized businesses because we recognize, as a government, the backbone of our our communities are the small businesses. So for the opposition member to say that we're not supporting businesses, that's absolutely not true, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome, I welcome to continue dialogue and listening to the uh, opposition parties as well as the partners, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? The member for Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I listened very carefully to the comments that were made by my colleagues, the members from 
Halton and Halliburton Corps of Lakes Brock. Excellent comments, in, in my view, on this throne speech that's been put forward by this government. And I think, particularly financially, we have to recognize that we're in a very, very deep hole here in Ontario, much worse than I think most people realize. Um, the member from Halton made mention of the fact that we're currently spending almost $11 billion on interest uh, for money that we've borrowed here in the province of Ontario over the last nine years. We're in a very deep hole, and if interest rates rise even by one interest point, uh, percentage point, that means we're going to pay another $500 million per year just on interest, not on improving health care, not on improving our education system, just on servicing debt. How we've gotten ourselves into this situation is because of uncontrolled spending on the other side. They don't know how to rein in spending, and that's what causes us a lot of concern. And what's uh, frankly allowing us or putting us in the position of not being able to support this throne speech, because they've talked about in vague generalities about how they're going to um, bring spending under control, but they're going to care a lot more than everybody else, and they're going to continue that kind of spending. What we need to do is have a very strict approach to the way that we go on in, in Ontario. We need to make sure that we get our spending under control so that we can afford all these services. We also need to have a very focused approach in kick-starting um, jobs and the uh, economy here in Ontario. The youth unemployment rate currently stands at about 15 percent. It's something that I hear about a lot in my riding, where young people are still forced to uh, live with their parents, and not because they, they want to, but because they don't have a job. They're coming out of universities with multiple degrees and that you're, you know, there are still no jobs for them to go to. That's what we were hoping to hear from this throne speech. We didn't hear that. Regrettably, we're not going to be able to support it. Thank you. Questions and comments? Member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to, uh, to comment on the remarks made, made by the member from Halt. And, uh, I think what, he, what he's attempting to do as a a senior member in this House and someone who I think uh, takes a pragmatic approach to uh, policy development and, and, and principle, actually, uh, is to, to offer you some space as the government uh, to do the right thing, to, I guess, rewind, press rewind uh, on some of the failed uh, exercises that you've embarked on, to give yourselves the room and the mea culpa on the gas plant fiasco.